Good morning on this beautiful sunny day in Melbourne. A very sunny day. It's Father's Day in Australia. I'm not sure what it is elsewhere, whether it's Father's Day elsewhere. Um, but we in Melbourne are holding our breath, waiting to hear the, I can't quite remember, but I think it's the pathway out of lockdown. And we are somewhat concerned because rumours are circulating that the exit from stage four may not happen next week as cleanly as we planned. So um, we will have to live with whatever we live with. And I must say, we are happy to be in spring. We go on our daily walks and watch more and more blossom coming out, coming more fully each day. There's uh, a couple along the road from us who in between the lockdowns dr drove up north and planned to sit on the new Queensland border until they were had been out of Victoria long enough. So we think they got into Queensland before they closed their borders. And so what we are doing is taking photos of their um, magnolia blooms against the blue sky so that they can see what they missed and so that we can thank them for planting such a beautiful tree um, and we certainly enjoy that. We also enjoy m mostly really pleasant interactions with other walkers. You know, we keep our distance, we're masked. Sometimes it's just hello, sometimes it's just a wave if they're on the other side of the street. Other times it's a little bit more of a conversation and it just adds to the feeling that despite the fact that we're staying apart from one another, we are still connected. And as I look around at these empty seats, which I've been looking at for too long, it seems, I know that we are still connected with all of you beloved people who normally sit in those seats. So thinking of you all with love and gratitude and handing over to Graham as the clock doesn't strike 11 but moves around to it. Well thank you Christine and a warm welcome to Blackburn Presbyterian Church this morning our uh, 25th Sunday of streaming church. What an extraordinary year it's been. Well, we're grateful to you for joining us this morning. I hope that you find this short time together uh, stimulating to your faith and an encouragement to you day by day. Please take time if you've come in through the website to look around the website to download the leaflet. Uh, it contains more information about the church. If you'd like notes on the sermon, they're included in the leaflet. If you've come via Facebook uh, through the live stream, then a warm welcome. Please take time to make your comments and uh, introduce yourself if you're new to us. This morning we're going to have uh, some of the usual elements. Amanda's going to play for us on viola. Uh, Christine will uh, read and lead Young at Heart. And uh, we'll continue the sermon series on great texts of the Bible. So with that in mind, uh, shall we begin with prayer? Let us unite our hearts in prayer. Almighty God, we thank you for your revelation of yourself as a loving Heavenly Father. And we thank you that the Lord Jesus has invited us to come, to come as adopted children to the one who is, as he said, my father and your father. We ask at this time that you will be with us in this service and that in all churches as the message is put into the internet and circulated in other ways, 
that people will discover the presence of your spirit and be led and guided into the paths of peace and joy and healing. So, Father, use this short time and use even us. For your name's sake, we pray. Amen. Well, Amanda has sent us a, a clip of her playing and I invite you to uh, relax and enjoy uh, this uh, Ave Maria. Well, here I am again, and that was beautiful music, and it was lovely, Amanda, to see you turn and look full on at the camera. We miss you with everyone else. Um, so last week, yeah, last week, I think fairly early in the week, probably Tuesday, I was talking with one of the ladies in our church, and we were talking about how much pleasure our gardens get give us. They always do, but possibly all the more when we're restricted to our five kilometer radius. Um, this dear friend's garden is much bigger than ours and also the resu result of decades of work. And she explained that she had planted things so there would be a sequence of growth and color. From gardens, we somehow got talking and discovered that we both love sunflowers. So this talk today is about sunflowers. I think I fell in love with sunflowers when we were on a train going through France. We passed field after field of sunflowers, all turned to face the sun. So I did some homework on sunflowers in preparation for this talk. This turning towards the sun is called phototropism. I hope I'm pronouncing it correctly. I also learned that for many people, sunflowers symbolize adoration, loyalty, and longevity. 
much of the meaning, of course, comes from its namesake, the sun itself. With brilliant yellow petals, also known as rays, sunflowers have an unmistakable sun-like appearance that's made them a crowd favourite. And looking, researching them on the internet, as one does, we heard of this sunflower farm in Canada, which had been open for many years at its peak bloom time, and people would come to take selfies with the sunflowers in the background. Well, in 28, 2018, they actually had to close, and we haven't been able to ascertain whether it was permanently or not. We hope not. But 7,000 tourists came wanting to take a selfie, and of course, they absolutely blocked the road. Sunflowers in un are unique. Perhaps that might not be as true now as we once thought it was, but they certainly provide energy in the form of nourishment and vibrancy, just like the sun with its heat and light. They apparently originated in the Americas in 1000 BC. I always marvel at how scientists can now date things so accurately in the past. And then they were cultivated as a valuable food source for centuries. When, of course, Europeans began to explore the New World, the flower's popularity spread as the rest of the world began to appreciate both its beauty and its sustenance. Artists have loved the sunflower's unique splendor throughout history. Those of the Impressionist era, possibly my favorite era, were especially fixated on sunflowers. So here we have a vase with 15 sunflowers by Van Gogh, and beside it now, a Gustav or Gustav Klimt farm garden with sunflowers. Beautiful, beautiful works. These beautiful flowers are, of course, also sourced for their seeds, and their oil, as well as being used for cooking, can be used as a skin emollient or sunflower or um, moisturizer. For a flower that reflects so many of the sun's bright characteristics, it isn't surprising that people enjoy basking in its warm glow. So what's the point of this? Well, you know that I like focusing I always have, but possibly I'm trying to do even more now, on beauty in God's created world. But there's also another reason. As, and this takes us back, thank you, Graham, for managing the slides, this takes us back to the sunflowers turned to the sun, their source of light, their source of energy. We are encouraged by the light, the writer of the letter to the Hebrews in chapter 2, verse 2. Let us keep our eyes fixed on Jesus. So let us turn to Jesus as sunflowers turn to the sun. Let us keep our eyes fixed on Jesus, on whom our faith be depends from beginning to end. So we may, may we all enjoy sunflowers and may we all be blessed by focusing on Jesus. Thank you. Thank you, Christine. Now, this, this morning's Bible reading is uh, going to be read by me, but I'm going to invite you to read it with me. I've chosen as our great text uh, this morning the 23rd Psalm. I remember uh, the director of music at Scotch College teaching the boys the, uh, to sing this psalm to the tune Crimmond, and uh, 
he said, it's your all-purpose hymn. He said, it's, uh, you'll find it at all stages of life. And uh, I think that's exactly, exactly correct. Um, so I'm going to invite you, I'm going to read the metrical version. I hope that uh, if you're a Presbyterian, you're very familiar with this. And if you're not, you will become familiar with it. So this is a 3,000-year-old song. And this is how it was translated into meter uh, in the 1650 version that was used in Scotland for centuries. I'd like you to read it with me. The Lord's my shepherd, I'll not want. He makes me down to lie in pastures green. He leadeth me the quiet waters by. My soul he doth restore again. And me to walk doth make within the paths of righteousness, e'en for his own name's sake. Yea, though I walk through death's dark vale, yet will I fear none ill, for thou art with me, and thy rod and staff me comfort still. A table thou hast furnished me in presence of my foes, my head thou dost with oil anoint, and my cup overflows. Goodness and mercy all my life shall surely follow me, and in God's house forevermore my dwelling place shall be. Psalm 23. Amen, and may God bless it to us. And of course it is the shepherd's psalm. And so I've chosen this image uh, to accompany the text today. The uh, the image is from the catacombs in Rome. It's uh, from the 4th century, between, somewhere between, and Christine alluded to dating earlier. This is dated between 300 and 350 AD. Uh, it's in a muse stands in a museum now, of course, and it's the good shepherd. He has uh, a sheep across his shoulders, a missing sheep or lamb. And this is a, a psalm of David. The uh, psalms in your Bible... Some of them have headings, and the headings are ancient headings, and so they give us ideas about the authorship of many of the Psalms, and uh, they are very important for us. So let's think about the Psalms of David, and, and I want to uh, think about three things uh, in each category, so we'll, I'll explain a bit more about that. But here's one reason why I think the Psalms are especially important and why I want to introduce you to uh, the Psalms as great texts from the Bible, and especially the 23rd. Athanasius, who was roughly contemporaneous with this image, uh, fourth century church father, uh, he said in, in his writings, <clears throat> in most of the scriptures, God speaks to us. But the Psalms are unique because in the Psalms, God speaks for us. So if you have joy in your heart, there's a psalm to suit that. If you have grief in your heart, there's a psalm to suit that. If you are lamenting, there are psalms for that. If you are gathered with your family, there are psalms for that. There are, if you hate someone or something, the psalms even invite you to bring your anger to God. Because that's where it should be expressed, not in, not in your relationship with a person. But you need to bring those things to God and he will defuse them for us. The Psalms. The Psalms are quoted by Jesus more than twice as much as any other book of the Old Testament. Of course, that's understandable because the Psalms were his hymn book and his prayer book. So what are we going to say about the Psalm of David? Well, three things. The first is, I want you to notice the metaphor that he's using to relate to the Lord. The Lord is my shepherd. Now, David was once a shepherd. Um, if you know the story of the Old Testament, you'll know that David uh, was out looking after the sheep when Samuel came to anoint someone from the house of Jesse to be the, the uh, king of God's uh, with God's blessing. And, and so the, the sons of, 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 uh, 
of, Day, of Jesse were all paraded before Samuel and again and again Samuel was persuaded that this wasn't the one, this wasn't the one. And there were seven sons and, and at the end he said, Have you only got, is that all of your sons? And Jesse said, well, there's the kid out the back looking after the sheep in the, in the, they didn't have paddocks in those days, it was just out there where the sheep were. They didn't have fenced areas. David was out there. Well, well, bring him in, he said. We won't start till he comes. David was a shepherd. And the shepherd spent time with the sheep. It was a difficult and demanding job. And interestingly enough, Moses before David had also been a shepherd. We heard last week that the Lord came to him and revealed himself uh, to Moses uh, at that, with that special name, Yahweh, I am the Lord your God. And uh, it was when he was, a sh- he was shepherding sheep. And, and in a sense, the image of the shepherd is, has been carried right into the royal family of Israel at this time because the leaders of God's people were there to shepherd the people, to care for them, to nurture the flock, and to bring God's blessing to the fore. So here is this great image. It's an image which uh, Israel uh, was familiar with. And David, as the shepherd of Israel, is mentioned almost a thousand times in your Bible. The name David remains popular to this day. And the second thing about it is that David knew the promises. He knew Moses. He knew Abraham. He knew the the stories of of these great uh, fathers of the faith. And, and they had been transmitted to him. God's blessing on the people had been sent down through these, these uh, people through whom God had made a covenant. And the same covenant promises that the Lord made with Abraham in Genesis 12 and renewed with Moses, and which I mentioned over 30 times in the book of Exodus, are extended to David. Where? Well, in Second Samuel chapter 7, you'll discover that the Lord makes these promises. Uh, to David and uh, and then when you come eventually to the New Testament you discover that uh, Jesus is uh, mentioned with not only Abraham at the start and Moses but then David the opening chapter of of, uh, the book of Matthew the opening of our New Testament places David as an ancestor of Jesus. So Jesus is of the line of David that was to know the blessing of God's presence always. And that meant that David was going to have a successor because the promise was that there would always be someone from the line of David to rule over God's people. Now who would that be? Well the New Testament says that it was Jesus. And uh, you, you may know the hymn, uh, Hail to the Lord's Anointed, Great David's Greater Son, says the hymn writer. Here is, is this image, uh, that, uh, that uh, David was to have someone who was to ex- excel him uh, far in splendor and royalty. And we know that person was Jesus. So Psalm 23 is what we're looking at. It's David's metaphor He had the covenant promises and he anticipated that somehow God would perpetuate his line. A thousand years before Jesus came, the psalm was penned by a shepherd, anointed by God's spirit, by the prophet. So that's the first thing. It's a psalm of David. And the second thing I want to notice is that Yahweh, the Lord, remember this is the, the special name of God, that was so revered that it was unpronounced. And we normally translate it as the word Lord in capital letters in your Bible. The Lord, my shepherd. Let's just think about then this image. First of all, a shepherd was a guide. This is one of the first things. The shepherd lived with the flock, as I've already alluded. The shepherd knew the sheep by name. We're not talking about a mob of sheep. I remember once on the cross coming south on the Newell Highway not long after we'd been in Australia. It must have been about 73. And uh, there was a, a mob of sheep crossing the highway and there were signs you know, to, 
to traffic in both directions as this mob of sheep cross the road. Thousands of sheep uh, across a highway. And uh, they, were, they were being uh, herded by people uh, on motorbikes as well as in, in utilities. And so that's, that's not the image we have in the Bible. We have a small flock, a shepherd who's always with them, a shepherd who knows the sheep by name and treats them like pets. He gave them names. They knew his voice. We know, in fact, that uh, they, they were being guided by the shepherd. He didn't drive them behind from a, an ag bike. He led them. He played music to them. He had to while away hours of time. He became excellent with his slingshot. We know that David uh, became poetic uh, partly as no doubt it was in partly within him, but also partly the context in which he lived. And so how does God guide the shepherd? Well, he knew the law. He knew Moses' commandments. David knew right and wrong. He didn't only look at the starry, starry sky and think beautiful, amazing thoughts about the Creator. Psalm 19 tells us that, that, he, that God spoke through his law as well as through the world around him. Another psalm that we could easily have looked at. The shepherd led the sheep. He didn't drive them from behind. He was seeking the best places for the sheep. He was looking for uh, fresh pastures and cool waters. He tended the sheep. He was concerned for their health. He was like a vet or a physician caring for them. Australians will know that uh, a ship carrying uh, a young vet was lost at sea this week. And we believe that that young man, a young father, uh, is missing at sea. And you will have seen, perhaps, his photo on television. It's a photo of him as a young man. He's only in his 20s. And he's holding a goat. And the goat has had a broken leg and he's splintered the, the goat's leg. And I thought, here's a young man caring for a goat. And I thought, David was probably younger than that, but he would have cared for his animals in the way that he knew how. So Lucas Order was a young vet and a young father and lost at sea. Well, David writes of the Lord, he restores my soul. How often have we sung that in the Scottish Metro version? What was David thinking? He restores my soul. Well, I think he's thinking more than physical well-being. Uh, he's thinking of psychological and spiritual health, and that's hinted at without doubt. The word that's translated soul, uh, translated by the Hebrew scholars into the Greek a couple of hundred years before Jesus, used the word suche, which is the word we get psychology from. It's the, it's the word soul. And so, so it has the idea of a f wholeness of well-being, and it also implies that because it talks about the right paths, making judgments here. He leads me in paths of righteousness. Derek Kidner says, the reviving of the sheep pictures the renewal of the man of God, spiritually perverse or ailing as he may be. David knew about that. He knew what it was to be spiritually perverse. And ailing, did he not write Psalm 51? Great penitential psalm. Have mercy on me, O God. Create in me a clean heart. Renew a right spirit within me. So it was that the shepherd was prepared to defend the flock. When he was just a youth, uh, remember we, he reported to, uh, he was taking food to his brothers who were at the battlefront uh, and he he was outraged when he heard the challenge of Goliath was not being met by any of the Hebrews. And he said he would go and fight Goliath. And this outrageous claim brought him into presence of King Saul. And Saul said, how would you do this? And he said, well, a, a lion came to the sheep and I killed it. And a, and a bear too threatened my sheep and I killed that. So he went forward to fight Goliath, having already... Uh, known what it was to defend the flock. And here we read, and we read it together, that the, that, uh, the shepherd provides security 
in the valley of the shadow of death. He is a defender of the flock. Now this teaching comes to us in the New Testament. Jesus, as I've said, knew the Psalms and he knew the Psalm. And I would want to suggest to you that it was almost consciously in his mind, it would seem. For example, he talks about, in John's Gospel, chapter 10, about the Good Shepherd. The Good Shepherd is known by the sheep. They know his voice. The Good Shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The Good Shepherd is the door to the sheepfold. In, in those days, a, a temporary sheepfold made either of rocks or um, or bushes, thorny bushes, uh, would, would have a, an opening with, through which the sheep would enter it. But then the shepherd would, would lie down and sleep there. And so the, the shepherd literally was the entry point to the, the fold. Now Jesus, talking about this, speaks of himself as the good shepherd. They matter more to him than life itself. Think about that, my dear friends that you matter more to Jesus than his life itself. To the psalmist, the Lord, like the shepherd, comes alongside and is addressed at this point in the psalm directly. You are with me. You are with me. What, a, what an ama amazing transition that is in the psalm. He does these things. The Lord is my shepherd and then you are with me. So now he's speaking to the shepherd. How blessed are those who have known the metrical version all their lives. I was in, reminded of this at a, an unforgettable moment about five years ago. I was at the bedside in the dementia ward of an aged care facility with a man who was not going to get better from his dementia. And as I usually do with pastoral visits, I the word pastoral comes from the shepherd's arm. Uh, as I normally do at pastoral visits, I, I, I prayed with him, but I thought, what does my prayer mean to him? His mind wasn't able to concentrate. And so I decided I would say the 23rd Psalm. And I said, the Lord is my shepherd. This transition from prayer. The Lord is my shepherd. And he said, I shall not want. I said, he makes me down to lie. And he said, in pasture screen he leadeth me. And all the way through the psalm, he knew the psalm. And we said alternate lines together. And so we went through the psalm. And he brought us to that point at the end of the third stanza where the intimacy is, is heightened enormously. And the metaphor changes. Because he said, the Lord is my shepherd. Not just a shepherd, he's my shepherd. And how does he heighten the intimacy here? Well, suddenly the Lord is the friend. The metaphor changes. You have prepared a banquet for me in the presence of my enemies. There's a note of victory here. It's one thing to survive the valley of the shadow, but it's another altogether to enjoy a triumph. Jesus came to set free those who were all their lifetime subject to bondage. He came to, and he was celebrating, remember, by eating and drinking. He was a friend of tax collectors and sinners, and it got up the noses of some people. What enemies did Jesus vanquish? How did he deliver those who were subject to the fear of death, to the opinions of others, to insecurity and troubles? Jesus sets the prisoner free. And in the, in the life of, of uh, David... The great liberation was the exodus in past history and the experience of Moses. And that's celebrated in many of the Psalms. But Jesus has done it by his self-giving. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. This is the cause of a great celebration. It's the celebration in the presence of things that we once feared that we no longer need to fear. This is why joy is such a characteristic trait of Christians. A great celebration. The redemption that flowed uh, from this, this victory that uh, our friend has won for us comes from a love beyond measure. I introduced this word last week. It's the word chesed. 
And it means pledged love. It's the love of kind of a marriage commitment. It's a love that ensures that goodness and mercy all my life shall surely follow me. Now, we think of love as a feeling. We feel love. We love certain things because um, something in them attracts us to them. I love McDonald's, maybe. Or I love my dog. Or I love my children. Or I love my suburb. And so there are things that we start to enumerate. But the love of God is different. It's a love that doesn't vary if the externals vary. Because it comes from within God. It is uh, translated in uh, the Bibles often as steadfast love. And it, it's a love that arises from God's own character, his own determination to love us, to seek the welfare of the ones he loves, to shower his blessings upon his people. So it arises from God's settled disposition to pursue the welfare of the beloved. And that's what the good shepherd did. Jesus came to pursue that welfare of his people. And you'll find if you read on in John's gospel beyond the chapter on the good shepherd, you'll find Jesus saying that he has prepared a place for you in John 14. And in chapter 15 of John's gospel, you'll find that he says, I've called you friends. Friends. It's as if this transition in the psalm was something that was something Jesus wanted to share. On that last night he was with his disciples. Greater love has no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends, and you are my friends. Truly God so loved that he gave his only begotten Son. And our redemption is a con consequence of this steadfast love of the Lord, this pledged love. God is faithful to his promises. Through Zechariah, the Lord says, they will look on me whom they have pierced. This is Yahweh. It's a challenging verse for Hebrew scholars, for Hebrew, for Jewish people, because how does Yahweh, how can Yahweh be pierced? And yes, it is clearly Yahweh that is speaking in Zechariah chapter 11, verse 10. They will look on me whom they have pierced. That's a challenging verse. But the Apostle Paul picks it up in, in writing in his speech to the Ephesian elders in Acts chapter 20. He says, Tend the flock of God which he has purchased with the blood of his own one or with his own blood. You'll find variant translations of that. But how, what blood does God have? And the answer, of course, is that God was in Christ, redeeming the world to himself. So at the cost of his own life, Jesus brings the scattered flock of God together. So he says there will be one flock and one shepherd. And your house shall be my home, as the writer to the Hebrews says. Now, of course, the house in David had in mind was the temple, the dwelling place of God the tabernacle and then the temple that was to be built by his son Solomon and which he oversaw in providing for it. But the, uh, the house that we think of here is, is the provision that the father makes for his children. His covenant love, covenanted love never ends. That was the promise to David in Second Samuel 7. Your family will always know this blessing. It will come through a descendant of yours to all the earth. This year has been difficult in the extreme for everybody. For our politicians of whatever color, to our police, from our seniors, and to our school children. We don't want to ignore that news. We want to take it on board. But as Christine has encouraged us, we want to turn our eyes again to Jesus, to the loving commitment of the Good Shepherd. An old Scots lady is reported to have said, when she was asked about the love of the Saviour, she said, it's better felt than telt. So I want to, you to ask yourself, as I ask myself, have I felt it? When do I feel it most? 
And have I telt it? Have I, have I told it? Have I been drawn to that image of home? When I think of the Lord, Yahweh, this is the personal name of God. Could I say, Yahweh, you are my friend, Lord Jesus. Thank you for this inestimable privilege. May God bless this old psalm to us today. I want to uh, lead you in prayer. I've put the prayers uh, on the uh, screen behind me and I invite you to join with me in prayer and uh, saying the Lord's Prayer together. So let, let us pray. O oh Lord our God, we bow before you with thanksgiving that you have not deserted us, but in Jesus, our shepherd, you have committed to guide, to heal, and to protect us. Draw near to us now in this time of prayer to comfort every heart. In Victoria, we are grateful that the drastic stage four lockdown is trending more and more to the desired goal. Guide our politicians, state and federal, as they take advice from medical specialists and cooperate to develop workable policies. We pray for the many services that are called upon to manage the implementation of COVID-related policies. We think of doctors and nurses, hospital and laboratory workers, police, paramedics, the ADF, and numerous other groups whose work facilitates the good ordering of society. We pray for a full recovery for all infected health workers and also ask for safety for the elderly and the disabled across the nation. Keep us mindful of those most vulnerable and help us to actively promote their welfare. Enable the churches to play a constructive and affirming role and may Christian people model the best COVID practices. We bring before you all whose mental health is adversely impact impacted by the virus, especially during lockdowns. We are concerned about the increasing number of people responding with destructive patterns of behavior and pray that they will discover helpful and healing pathways. Especially on this Father's Day in Australia, we pray that fathers everywhere will seek to lovingly protect and care for their families and for the vulnerable among us. We pray uh, for your help, especially for those homes in which fathers are missing. We ask that you will be with those who lament that loss and we ask that you would bring forth uh, modeling, inspire us by your own role as father to your people. As COVID-19 continues its silent and deadly global presence, we pray for your help for poor and unstable nations. Bring forth good government and wise counsel and improve public health and hygiene. We have heard of poisonings, abductions and killings, the imprisonment of journalists, and of lives lost at sea, our hearts are heavy and we ask you to comfort the grieving and hinder the abusers of power. We ask that you revive your work in the hearts of people everywhere. Bless the peacemakers. We thank you for the commitment of Rami El Hanan and Basim Araman to speak together to promote peace between Israel and Palestine. Lord Jesus, we are awed that you call us friends. We know that it was for us you laid down your life. Help us to delight in the love you have revealed. May it shape us. Reassure our hearts with the presence of your Holy Spirit. Enable us to speak your hope to our neighbors. These things we pray in the name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior, who taught us to pray saying together, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth 
as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Now may the grace of the Lord Jesus, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you and with those whom you love, today and always. Amen.